our bodies are going haywire. We have spiking incidences of allergies, of asthma, uh, cancer rates are soaring. We have reproductive issues, even behavioral issues. And then of course we have the massive epidemic of mental health issues. So that has poised, uh, I think, people for the next conversation of what do we do about it, which makes my job a whole lot easier. I generally don't have to convince people there's a problem. So welcome to Green Planet, Blue Planet podcast. I'm here today with Lisa Bronner. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you so much, Ruelan. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm excited for our conversation. You just recently wrote and published a book, Soap and Soul, A Practical Guide to Minding Your Home, Your Body and Your Spirit. And I want to dive into that and, you know, all of the, the wisdom that you, you're sharing in the book, maybe not all of it, to leave some, some things unsaid and people actually go and get the book. Um, what, made you, what made you write the book? You know, what, what was the, that moment where you're like, you know what, let me just, I want to write a book, let's go. It was, it was much longer than a moment. Um, I'd had the idea for a while. Uh, I've been writing a blog for 15 years, and that's a great way of communicating with people. I love the immediacy of online platforms and engaging with people. I can get their responses and answer their questions right away. But the disadvantage is that everything's very fractured. You, they get one idea this week and another idea next week, and they've, you know, four weeks later forgotten the first one. And so I wanted to write something that was comprehensive, that had the big picture all in one spot. So people could see how uh, all the ideas work together as we care for our bodies and our homes and ourselves, um, that it's not, they're not just isolated events, but they're really part of a holistic life. Yeah, brilliant. I, I do want to go into some of those, you know, holistic life kind of insights and tips, but um you know, context here in the beginning of the episode, I had your, your, your brother on, I think like a, a year or two ago, David Bronner, and he, he's quoted to say about your book, I teared up and laughed out loud reading my sister's book. Her writing is amazing. Her sense of humor is so smart and funny and her insights are deep and profound. This is as much a self, self-help guide for leading a simple and spiritual life as it is about cleaning. Does, is he nailing it or is, is this, is this the, the nice words of her brother? Well, you know, David is not somebody who uh, who sugarcoats things. So, no, I was so moved by his words. And honestly, he said my book made him tear up. His words made me tear up because you know, David calls it as he sees it uh, and he'll tell you what he thinks. So, I mean, I really appreciated his response. And the other thing I wasn't sure about when David and my mom and the rest of the family read it is, you know, I'm telling memories that they have too, but each of us remembers things a little bit differently and we have different relationships with people and with situations. And I wasn't sure if if uh, they were going to be okay with how I presented things and how I presented them in the book. And so, uh, you know, David um, does a lot of public, uh, public things. People know him. Um, and so to get a sister's take might have been a little bit awkward, but uh, so I really appreciated that he was... Uh, supportive and and enjoyed the final product that's awesome yeah i mean it it sounds daunting if you have shared family memories and then you know to get get out your uh, personal perspective on them but but that's also life right like i mean we could look at the same thing with with six different people and we'll probably get six different reports of what's actually happening um maybe walk us a little bit into into that storyline and and you know get get our, our listeners to just um, go on the journey of the book with you. So it's, as you said, you started with a blog, you, you've been writing different ideas for many years, and then this is more like a holistic guide into the way you see the world, you know, the way you grew up as part of the Dr. Bronner's kind of magic soap family. Um, yeah, where would you start that journey? Right, well, one of the things that held me back from actually starting the book for a while was figuring out how to structure it. There are many books out there about green cleaning and natural house care and all of that. I have a lot of them myself. I've used them. Uh, so I didn't want to write something repetitive. Uh, I wanted to offer something new. And so a book of recipes wasn't enough. Um, I, wanted, I wanted to give people something that wasn't out there. And eventually I got more comfortable with the idea of putting a lot of myself in the book a lot of my own stories. And so the book's probably half stories, half recipes, as far as the, the pages go. Um, 
of sharing how I came to know these recipes, how I came to use them, the struggles I had in adopting them, um, but also bigger things about my own development um, professionally, uh, finding my public voice. I used to be terrified of public speaking, my journey as a parent, uh, my journey as a woman. And so all of these things I worked into the book as well as the history of our family business. You know, we're five generations of soap making, 75 years um, with Dr. Bronner's as a company. Um, and there's a lot of story to tell there too. There, some of it's out there, articles have been written, um, but not, no, none, nothing's been written by a family member. And so uh, I wanted to share that as well. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to work into the book, besides the recipes, I mean, there's a ton of recipes out there. You can go to a blog all over the place and mm -hmm. find recipes for house cleaning. Uh, but there's not a lot of explanation about why, um, how do these work, uh, especially if somebody is dubious of green cleaning methods or, or uh, simple body care. You know, how do we know that these old ways of doing things are still the best way um, that developments and and science haven't displaced them. And so I dive into the chemistry behind them, the chemistry of soap, which I'm particularly excited about, probably more excited than most people, the uh -huh. chemistry of soap and why soap works and why we don't need more harsh uh, cleaners for our bodies or for our homes, um, why certain things don't work. Uh, even within the realm of green, there's a lot of um, suggestions out there that are actually not good. And if somebody mm -hmm. tries them, they're going to get really frustrated with the uh, green cleaning and just assume, oh, that's that's just a trendy thing that doesn't work. Um, and so I dive into a lot of chemistry, uh, make sure people understand what's going on. And then lastly, like there's a whole series of questions I get interacting with consumers about labels, um, about how to read a label. What do labels mean? Not, not just the ingredient list, although those are important, but even claims on labels, certifications, uh, and so I wanted to give people a guide on how to shop and how to make decisions about the products that they're bringing into their homes. So all of that ended up getting woven together and producing the book. Yeah, I love that. You know, um, you know, starting with the the going green blog and 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 just these these different aspects and insights. And, and you know, I'm, there's something I just heard you say, which is just the the frustration that people can find when they they follow something that actually turns out not being as as green or as holistic or as insightful as you know it, it maybe proclaims to be and i think it's a little bit the world we're living in right like not everything um not everything is as it as it looks right and and sometimes it's really worth reading the label i mean for me personally that that specifically with food that's the case you know i mean if i if i can't pronounce an ingredient or i don't know what it is like do i want to put it into my body um and it's very similar with you know if you're just taking the 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 red thread of, of soap here and the red thread of cleaning. I think just the, the, the mere craziness of what we're putting into the water uh, across the world, um, it will have to change at some point because we're seeing like, you know, horrendous consequences of that. But I mean, you grew up in this kind of a, a family with, with, you know, a tradition, a legacy, a big company. Um, what's your experience with it when, you, when you're out in the world? Like, is, is this something people are generally super excited about or as you just said it like are you maybe you know i don't want to say like soap crazy but like are you maybe uh, someone who's just like so much more into this topic than most people well what's the experience for, there fortunately for me a lot of the groundwork has been laid already i think about my grandfather who was talking about natural products and return to nature in the 1940s and was so far ahead of his time that he sounded crazy um, he actually was institutionalized uh, against his will because of how far out there his ideas were, uh, not just on, on chemicals, but also on you know, topics such as you know, world peace. Um, that's another story. But the, as far as green cleaning goes and, and, and body care, you know, there's been a rising awareness uh, in the cultural conversation that we have a problem. Our bodies are going haywire. We have spiking incidences of allergies, of asthma. Uh, cancer rates are soaring. We have reproductive issues, even behavioral issues. And then, of course, we have the massive epidemic of mental health issues. So 
that has poised, uh, I think, people for the next conversation of what do we do about it, which makes my job a whole lot easier. I generally don't have to convince people there's a problem. But there still is a little bit of of pointing out to people where the problem might be coming from. Um, the thing about body care and cleaning is these are a lot of tasks that people don't don't give a second thought to. They're so instinctive, you know, our habits. Um, so to point something out, it's like we're pointing out the invisible. Um, the other day, I was taking a walk with my neighbor, um, and I live out in the country. We have acres between our houses, and we were walking down a street, and I could smell somebody's laundry. I was acres away from a house, and I could smell their laundry. Like, can you imagine how intense those fumes must be in the house? Um, or right outside the house, because I'm sure it was a vent that was that was venting it out. Uh, and my neighbor just didn't even, it, it, she didn't even notice the scent because it's so just a normal thing. Um, and so to point those out, sometimes uh, there's always that moment of, oh yeah. But as far as willingness to engage on this topic, a lot of people want to make improvements, want to go green, want to be simpler. They don't know where to start. There's so much advice out there. So many people saying they have the answers and, um, you know, where do you start? So, you know, I hope that I give people some toeholds, some first steps, uh, ways to, to get going. And uh, then after one step at a time for a while, they've come a long way. Well, you know, let's 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 dive in a bit deeper. Where would you start? Like, let's just say, you know, you're you're your neighbor and you just I don't know, um, not to name, mention any brand names, but you just use like some really chemical toxic, um, you know, potion to, to do your laundry with. And, you know, I haven't used those in a while, but but I, I get it. Like I, I can literally smell it uh, on people's clothes when when they stand next to me, because like, yeah, the more you detox from harsh chemicals or, you know, the more you you know, it's the same with, I don't know, alcohol or coffee. If you don't drink it, you smell it on someone from five meters away, right? But where would you start if, if, you're, if you're not on that journey or if, if you're listening um, right now and, you know, maybe you've, you have started, but, but you're looking for more insights. Like, you, you're one of those people that's pioneering this kind of a journey. Yeah. It, it depends upon what your motivation is. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. a lot of people start because they have a crisis. They have a health crisis or they have a reaction or, or their child does or even their pet does. And there's, there's a moment of, I have a problem. Um, and in that situation, I mean, you need to start with where, you know, the, the, the site of the problem is it, is, are you reacting to an ingredient? Are you, are you reacting to something in the air um, to pinpoint that? If people are wanting to take this journey because they've been convinced, you know, by the principles, uh, by the data, by the numbers of what's showing up in our, in our water supply and in our air, um, and they're coming at it from a more, I don't know, theoretical approach, then the, the priority I would give them is, is what we breathe. I, as I was talking about with the laundry things, um, I think people don't pay enough attention to what's in their air. What's in our air is what penetrates into us the most because we're not just talking about something on our skin that uh, goes transdermally. We're talking about something that is going inside our body into our lungs, which is designed to pull things out of the air and put them in our bodies. So we wanna make sure that what's in our air is clean, um, which means we need not to be putting things into our air. Um, fragrance is a, is a hot topic for me. Um, Fragrance is something that's not essential to our cleaning tasks. It's added to make them more pleasant. Um, but usually the greatest problems that we find in cleaners, the greatest problems we're going to encounter are in the fragrance. Yes, many cleaners are you know, horrible if you drink them and accidents do happen and people, you know, or children or pets accidentally ingest them. But by and large, um, you know, those are, are, are on the side. Um, but what does happen to every one of us that uses our cleaners is that we breathe, um, everybody. And so what's being emitted by cleaners into the air is going to get into every one of us, whether we're the person doing the cleaning or we are, mm -hmm. you know, the person walking into the room afterwards. Uh, one of the biggest pushes for me personally in my own journey of adopting better cleaners was the study that came out 
that showed that people who were the regular cleaners in their environment, whether they were professionally uh, a cleaner or whether they were just the primary caretaker of the home, were 40% more likely to develop COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. 40%. Wow. That was me. I mean, I'm the primary cleaner of my house. Um, the study was a long-term study on nurses and professional house cleaners, and the primary culprit was bleach. Um, and so the irony is that we do these things. We clean our homes and we take care of our spaces to improve our lives, yeah. to, to make our you know, areas safer, more hygienic. And yet the very act of what we're doing is actually harmful. So as far as where to start, I encourage people to start with things that are emitting fumes. Um, definitely, if it's, we're talking like an air freshener or a, a plug-in um, scented air thing or candles, um, those things are not doing you any favors. If there's a smell in your house that you're trying to cover up, you need to go to the source of the smell and figure that one out and get rid of it rather than trying to cover it. Um, mm. Where's the line there on that though? Is it like essential oils is still good for you and then anything that's chemical isn't anymore or like? No, well, that, that's a tricky one because mm. I mean, not all things that are natural are, are good for us. I don't think that constantly inhaling essential oils is good for us either. I mean, essential oils are fine in moderation. And then there is a vast range of essential oils and some are have more potent side effects than others. Uh, I'm not an expert on essential oils, um, but I know that generally everything is uh, best in moderation. And so, yeah, as I said, cleaning the air. The other topic I talk about a lot besides house cleaning, though, is body care. Um, you know, probably about a third of my book is body care and the rest is house care. With body care, where you want to start is with products that you are exposed to the most. This would be our leave on products that we put on our skin and they're on us all day. And if it's a product we wear every day, then they're on us all day, every day. So this would be things like our deodorant, uh, lotion, sunscreens. Uh, if there's a, you know, if you wear makeup uh, regularly, um, uh, even hair products, which are in con right. constant contact with us, because that gives us the biggest amount of exposure, biggest opportunity for our bodies to absorb them. If there's something that's transdermal, which means it can go through the skin. Um, and so those are the products to analyze first, uh, read the labels, figure out if they're the best for you, work on replacing them, which takes a while because you want to like your product. So it takes a while to find a product that you like, but Fortunately, there's a lot out there now. Um, and then once you have those leave-on products all cleaned up, um, then take a look at the wash-off products, your, your soaps, your toothpaste, the, the products that you know are mere seconds of exposure usually in how we use them. Um, and so they're not generally as, um, as you know top of the list. Right. Still important, there, though, when you get to them. There is such an interesting you know, kind of paradox there. And, and I guess you know, for most people, maybe there's there's no time to think about it or maybe there's no 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 desire to go deeper into it you know as, as you said earlier until there's a problem and that's kind of the symptom of our entire society right like we, we we've come out of like a hundred years of like over industrialization which you know some of that is very very um it's definitely also positive you know because otherwise you and i couldn't have this conversation right now if we didn't have two laptops in front of us and then obviously anything that that is out of moderation and into like you know, this, this, um, yeah, almost like, you know, o overdone, um, overdone way of just, this is the only way, right? Like if, if we want to industrialize everything, the whole world has to globalize. And I think it's just a parallel on a bigger level between how we, you know, how we see the state of the world, how we see geopolitics, how we see um, progress, technology can replace everything and how we just take care of our own bodies. Right? The, the problem almost being that who we are as, as people, who we are as humans, somehow isn't good enough or somehow needs to be covered up, right? Or somehow needs to be changed fundamentally because something's wrong with, with who we are as people. And the, the more we become like machines, the, the less flaws we have and we get closer to perfect. And, you know, that's not my opinion at all personally, but it, it seems to be a very big red thread in the, the last hundred years of our society. And, I think it's, you know, if someone does do the research, it's not so hard to understand where this was, where that comes from and where that originates. But I think finding that middle ground where we realize, okay, how much of that do I want to let into my life? 
And how much do I actually want to embrace, you know, being green, being healthy, being like being natural, being organic. Um, I think that's really where the conversation is happening is like, where's that healthy middle path? Do you have some, some thoughts, some insights on that? Yes. I, it's, I mean, there is a balance to be found between, between the old and the new. I mean, there certainly are, uh, I'm a fan of many, uh, modern, uh, inventions and institutions and advancements, but that doesn't mean that we need to ditch everything that has ever been done before. Uh, and sometimes we jump a little too wholeheartedly and uh, unjudiciously into something new because it's exciting and it promises something and it may well deliver on that promise. Um, but sometimes I think we don't do it mindfully enough to see bigger, a bigger picture, to see long term consequences, um, how things work together. And that's where we get into trouble. So with things like you know, soap. Soap is thousands of years old. Mankind has known how to make soap for, for millennia. It's one of our oldest reactions. And then in the uh, post-World War II era, it was the rise of detergents, which can do the same thing. They're both uh, surfactants, which means uh, they're surface active agents. They, they grab things and whisk them away. Uh, so they both clean. Um, but the issue came when when really the world uh, uh, jumped into detergents is they did not look at the long-term consequences of many of them. Now, detergents are a vast realm. There's so many different types of detergents, but some of them that were being made at first were extremely durable, which meant they don't break down. They don't biodegrade. And so suddenly our, our rivers were foaming um, because they were filled with these detergents from our wastewater. Um, and, uh, you know, Yes, the detergents cleaned surfaces, um, but the long-term consequences were not examined. So with any you know, advancement and development, we, we just need to be very mindful and not get too ahead of ourselves and too excited about the new and the shiny, but take a moment to, to look big, to look at, uh, to ask the questions of how will this impact things. Um, the same is true. Our, Dr. Bronner's was a lot of activism in the realm of agriculture. Uh, because we're very careful about the sourcing of our raw materials, uh, palm oil, coconut oil, uh, cocoa now with our magic all in chocolate, um, making sure that uh, just getting the ingredient we need isn't having a bad impact on uh, the environment, the community, the farmers that are producing it for us. Yeah, I'm um, glad you're bringing this up because I remember the, the conversation about the regenerative or um, organic certified uh, that, that Dr. Bronner was part of launching. I, I'm sure that's exactly. kind of where you're going right now, no? That, no, it totally is. But it's regenerative. That, so the, the, as we were analyzing what we're doing and making sure that we're, we're contributing back into the environment and leaving things better than we found it, led us to this path of regenerative organic agriculture. And I love the word regenerative. I didn't like it at first. I'm like, oh, that's too long a word. Can't we come up with something, <laughs> you know, snappier? Um, but... I'm also uh, I'm also an English major, and I love the root of the word regenerative, which yeah. means to go back to the beginning, um, and to to bring new life into the agricultural system, which led us back into older agricultural practices. Um, the issues of why our landscape is being depleted and why there's so much destruction in the name of agriculture is because of the rise of of monocultures, monocrops of clearing land and planting one thing. Well, nature doesn't do that. That we have all of, you know, natural history to look at the fact that nature does not uh, grow things in a monoculture. So regenerative organic agriculture was going back to how nature farms in diversity, utilizing the strengths of, of different um, of plants and different shade systems and uh, different nutrients being brought in, different pest resistance being brought in by different plants. And it might sound easier just to clear the land and plant one thing, you know, uh, let's just focus. Um, long term, it's not easier because it creates a lot of problems. So so sometimes the advancements are great. I'm all for them. Um, but sometimes we we leave things behind that we shouldn't have. Uh, so with soap, with agriculture, uh, other realms as well. Yeah. And, you know, you're, you're talking about this, 
this very clearly this this impact on the natural cycles you know this is this has been a topic in in my own journey over the last decades and and specifically in the last few years with the podcast green planet blue planet to understand deeper and deeper well what are those natural cycles those regenerative cycles of nature and what would a world look like that was organized in a different way you know maybe maybe around bioregions and bioregional health and, and maybe around natural cycles of the nature inside of us and the nature outside of us right and 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 so where then we we have a like a touch point with with a modern um you know technology and a, a modern kind of chemistry and a modern yeah way of just you know basically manipulating reality in in this really advanced alchemic way that, that we can as humans i think somewhere there there might be a, a, the middle path you know i mean i don't personally know all all the yeses and nos there but i, I think it's as you said like not just embracing everything just because it's new or uh, mm -hmm. embracing it because it looks shiny for the moment and i mean it seems to be how we humans learn i'm curious about you know this question and, and how you how you answer it is like what what do you think it takes for humanity to, to make those learnings um, it seems to be we learn when you know when we get sick and then we realize oh wow that was totally the wrong way or like it's five five minutes before midnight we, we got to change or like i'm writing a test tomorrow let's learn as much as i can right um these this last minute actions these last minute pushes seem to be part of our psychology what's your take on this like what would it what, what is required for humanity to learn and, and kind of to learn from past mistakes you're you're absolutely right about our being motivated by crisis and procrastination i all too often that's been part of my own journey and i always regret it that i could have come to the same point if i had just been slower and more mindful and not just charged ahead or put off some difficult task uh, until it became more difficult, but more urgent and then done it poorly uh, and then learn from that mistake. That, I mean, that's the wrong way to do things. And we would live much pleasanter lives if we did it a different way. Um, I think slowing down is crucial. Uh, we live in constant hurry. And we need to take the hurry out of our lives because we don't function optimally when we're hurried. We're just, we're just trying to get, we're trying to survive when we're hurried. We're not mindful. We don't think about things. And that's when we make, we make mistakes or we get ourselves in situations that we didn't intend, either with our health or with our mental well-being, because we're hurried. So the first thing I think we need to do is we need to slow down. Um, literally, I think we need to take things out of our schedule. We need to plan what I call, uh, my husband actually came up with the term, zero time, where we don't have something scheduled, uh, white spaces in our life, because this is when we become more aware of uh, the bigger picture. You know, when we're hurried, we're, we're looking straight in front of us, you know, the next thing. But when we have a moment or we have some white space, we can look up and we can raise our head above the race and we can see, okay, what's, what, what else is going on here? Um, you know, most of my work focuses on the home and how we live in it and how we take care of ourselves in the house. And for too long, um, we've seen our houses as little individual, you know, worlds. And once it's out of our house, it's not our concern and it doesn't impact us. Um, but when you look at the bigger bigger picture of, let's say, what's happening in our waterways, um, you know, a recent problem that has surfaced has been the buildup of forever chemicals in our waterways, in our land, and now we're finding in our bodies. We are all connected. And generally what's polluting one part of our, of our world is... is present, even if it hasn't been discovered yet in, in others. So forever chemicals, uh, which are um, uh, really durable uh, chemicals in body care and in house cleaning products um, and in industrial uh, uh, chemicals that don't break down. They really, really, really don't break down. And we can't even yet uh, find a way to break them down with like some magic enzyme or um, chemical reaction. Um, and so all we know right now is that there's a problem because we jumped into these chemicals, putting them in everything. Uh, forever chemicals are generally found in products that are smooth and um, non-stick. You know that that's kind of an odd product. Uh, but think about Teflon coatings of pans. Think right. about 
waterproof resistant coatings on fabrics, um, fire resistant coatings on um, firefighting equipment, but also things that glide over our skin, um, things that are in our, our sunscreens and our lotions to make them smooth. Uh, these also have a forever chemicals commonly in them. Um, and so, yes, it gives us a smooth texture, the nonstick, the waterproof, the fireproof, those are good things, but they're building up to a big problem that we've gotten ourselves into just by jumping into some great new development without looking at what is the end of this? What's the outcome here? Um, you know, things don't just disappear. They have to, mm. they have to cycle back or they just build up, they accumulate in our bodies and they accumulate in our water. Um, and then we have to deal with them eventually. Right. This is one of those really clear, really obvious truths behind regeneration, right? It's like, um, trash is an illusion. Like everything stays in the cycle and we'll have to continue to evolve into the next life cycle. Like it's just not, not like something we just dispose of and I don't know, send out into the, um, the blackness of the universe around us. Oh, um, we've tried that one and now yeah. we have issues of space junk and, and uh, issues in space. You know, one of the movies that I found the most disconcerting and I don't, I, I don't know how much it was meant to be, but I don't know if you've seen the children's movie called Wally where yeah, humanity yeah, yeah. has to abandon Earth because it's too covered with trash and they leave the robots behind to take care of it. I found that movie terrifying and true and uh, really, an, you know, I don't know if my children got it in that way, but um, mm -hmm. anyhow, I, we need to think about, uh, you know, the the end, the the full cycle of products, of ingredients, of of things that we're using because they don't just go away. Yeah, totally. I, I think, you know, I want to transition into into something really like that's that's become more and more meaningful to me in this whole context, which is just the energy it requires that the personal energy, not, not you know, not talking about light and turning on our electricity, but the energy it requires personally to actually devote ourselves to a topic. Right. So um, especially when it is about all of the things we've done wrong in terms of environmental um, damage in terms of forever chemicals etc it it can turn into a pretty sinister a pretty dark topic really fast and it can be quite draining for some people right which i think is also maybe a reason why for some people it's just like whatever i just need this right now and i will just go ahead and do this because i can change the world right but but then really you know there's a flip side to that where for some people and, and you're one of them lisa it's it it switches them on it's a passion right and it's something where it's like, when I live in a way that I know is of integrity with these ways, and I, and I don't just do things because I could, but I, I choose wisely what I do and, and learn. And through that example I'm setting, I, I educate and I share. Um, it takes courage, right? It takes energy, but it also might create this passion and this spark. And I want to go into something very specific here, because um, I know you've, you've read your book out loud as an audible. Um, so the book is available on Kindle, on you know the paperback, and as an audible. How was that process for you to read your own book and just put your own voice, your own energy into that? I'm, I'm curious to understand because it, it sounds like a very fun thing to do. I, when I heard that my book was going to become an audiobook, I was, of course, thrilled. Uh, my next thought was, wait a second, there's a lot of recipes in there. How, how did that work as an audiobook? Um, and then my third thought was, I want to read it. <laughs> because there are all those stories in there and they're, they're yeah. my stories. I couldn't imagine them coming through in somebody else's voice. Mm. Um, and so I did get to read it. I had to audition to read my own audio book. Oh, wow. I guess they needed to make sure I didn't have some sort of annoying squeaky voice. I, I passed. Um, and so and then when I sat down to I prepare to read it, I did a little bit of research about, you know, how to narrate and oh goodness, people who are professional audiobook readers, like they have coaches uh in training. And I didn't have time for that or know where to find such people. So I, you know, listened to a few podcasts and YouTube videos and made do with those. Um, but then I was reading my book, and as I told you, I dive into chemistry and ingredient safety. And those words are really hard to say. They're and I kind open. of re <laughs> regretted like, 
who wrote this book? Who put these words in here? <laughs> and I had to do a lot of research of uh, how to pronounce some of these words. Um, and believe it or not, there are YouTube videos that dive into chemistry words and, and, and how people say them. Um, I talked with our R&D uh, team, uh, Dr. Bronner's, like, tell me how to say these words because I've only ever written them. So I had to practice and that was, that was tough. So we're, let, let me, let me see if I can give you an example. Um, Mesoisothiazolinone. That's an ingredient of we should course. avoid in our products. <laughs> so that is a preservative and uh, a lot of people are sensitive to it and causes contact, uh, allergic contact. It goes contact back to what I said earlier that if I can't pronounce it, I don't know what it is. Right. I don't know if I really want it in my body. Right. I mean, yeah. Yeah, that was that was a case in point. So when it came to reading the audiobook, like I loved reading the stories. Those were my favorites. Um, but then it came to when, uh, you know, getting into the ingredients you should avoid. And I didn't struggle, but I had to do a lot of preparation. And then when I was in the moment, I was in the booth and I knew I knew what was coming up. Um, you know, my heart was was racing a little bit, you know, like, you know, you've got the the big the big moment in your a sporting event or whatever, running up to kick that ball. I was like, all right, here we go. And, uh, you know, going straight through them. Um, it was fun. Uh, we made it. And uh um, you know, I think for the most part, nobody's going to argue with me on how I pronounce those words because very few of us know how to pronounce them anyways, which is kind of the point. That's really funny. And I, I can totally believe that there are YouTube channels for all of this. I, I just pulled it up here. There's, there's over 110 million YouTube channels out there as of right now, which oh, is a lot, right? Like yeah. different channels of people putting out different, different content. And, you know, just for context, I think there's just about 4 million podcasts out there, which, which is also <laughs> a lot, but much less. Um, which is a, you know, my follow-up question to that is, you know, we, we just, I just kind of contextualized it with bringing the good energy for topics that can be quite dire when we dive deeper into that. So who else and what else inspires you that's out there when you look around the landscape of people that are like in the regenerative movement that are, that are, you know, educating people about organic or, you know, matters of soil or, um, you know, matter, matters of uh, personal hygiene or whatever it might be. Like, what what else do you find inspiring in that space? Because I, I think it, it's really worth to continue to inspire each other more so than just like break down what the problem is, you know? Absolutely. And it frustrates me when I, well, complaining frustrates me in general. I, I don't like hearing people complain. I like people you know, solving problems. My my husband, who's chief operating officer at Dr. Bronner's, his, his tagline that he says to people is, don't come to me with problems, come to me, me with solutions. And that's the thing. I, I We cannot sit in our problems and wallow and, you know, give up hope. We are always going to have problems. Um, we have to figure out what is the next step we can take over this. There was There was a moment I talk about in my book, it's going to seem very simple, um, but where that, that point of, let me take the next step forward and make progress. Um, it was a moment I had two young kids. My youngest uh, at the time was, was, um, well, he had an undiagnosed, uh, gastrointestinal issue. I didn't know about that, but all I knew was that he was rarely happy. Uh, and I always had to be carrying him and I was getting very, very, you know, mournful about that. Not, not about my son, but I was like, so frustrated that I couldn't do things. I, I like being active and I, I had my son with me, although there are so many exercises you can do where you use your baby as your weight. It's great. And they naturally gain weight. So you're naturally using it stronger weight. and stronger. Oh, it's fantastic. I was never so strong <laughs> as I was when I had him anyhow. So, uh, and it, I was wallowing one evening, uh, holding my son, my house was just cluttered. I wanted to clean it. And I wanted to do it efficiently and fast, but I couldn't because I had my son on me. Um, but I had this moment of realization that, okay, I can't do it the way I want to. Two hands, let's get it done. But I, I still had one hand. I only had my son in one arm. I still had one hand. And I could still make progress and improve things, uh, even if it was slower. And from that moment, um, not only did it help me just not be so you know self-pitiful, but it really helped me to take that point into other realms of maybe I can't do everything I want to, and maybe I can't see how I'm possibly going to get to the finish line, but there's a next step I can take. So when we look at these dire issues of pollution 
or um, even our health issues, um, we can't sit in the problem. We need to we need to think through what is a next step that I can take here. And there there always is something. And I think that when we take that step, it's empowering. It brings hope that there's progress being made. Um, as far as um, other people or or works that inspire me. I love seeing people tackle difficult problems and come up with workable solutions that mm -hmm. work for everyone. I mean, the, the regenerative organic agriculture is one. I don't work specifically in it. I just get to talk about it. Um, the Regenerative Organic Alliance uh, was founded by the Rodale Institute, which has always been on the forefront of um, agriculture, organic agriculture development. So uh, between Rodale, Patagonia, and Dr. Bronner's, um, and really tackling this issue of agriculture depleting the world. We see there's these documentaries about palm oil, and it's horrible, 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 and there's nothing to be done. It's terrible, terrible, terrible. All we can do is not use palm oil. Okay, that doesn't solve the problem. Right. Because Palm oil is actually not the problem. The problem is how we're doing agriculture. And so to take this step forward, to find this way of, of, of doing agriculture that um, is rebuilding the land, it's not only not destroying the land, it's rebuilding it, bringing new habitat, enriching the soil. I just find that super inspiring. Uh, and I love that that people were willing to look beyond how bad things were and to find this beautiful, hopeful, workable solution. Uh, so I just encourage people to, you know, find the people that are helping, find the people that are moving forward um, and don't just focus your eyes on the, on the problem um, and you join them. And eventually that creates momentum and a movement. Um, there's a lot of work to be done and we can't, Individually, we can't do it all, but if right. each of us does something, then it adds up to a lot. And, and that's a huge point that, that you're striking there, Lisa. I love your answer there. And it's, it's participation, right? It's like coming, uh, kind of moving out of the stands onto the field and, and understanding that life is not just something we're consuming and watching and, and criticizing and talking about others, but we actually, when we find our cause, and you know, people often like to talk about purpose, when we find our purpose, when we find our thing, we, we apply ourselves, right? And, you know, sometimes maybe that would be even easier if, if I didn't also have to make money to earn rent, but sometimes these things kind of overlap, right? Or they, they, they turn into some form of, um, yeah, just like symbiotic factor between what people do for a living work and bread and butter and, and how they apply the rest of their energy. But I think this is, this is the key difference between a world that uh, you know, it creates healthy, thriving humans in a healthy, thriving environment in a world that is based on destruction and war is, is more people participating and just really standing up for what they believe in. And um, this is what this podcast always has been. It's just a call to action. Like anyone listening, um, you know, go a step forward, be, be you in the world. Absolutely. It is, it takes a tremendous amount of creativity to figure, to figure out where does my ability my opportunity and my passion, where do they align? Where do they intersect? It takes some, some, you know, deep thinking sometimes to figure that one out or t talking to people or, or time. Uh, sometimes it takes some going down some, some dead end roads and realizing you've got to backtrack. I think it's funny that my family owns a soap company. And yet, you know, from our perspective, we're, doing our part to, you know, save the world and the environment. Um, what do we have? We have soap. We have a label that we say a lot of things on. Um, my, we started with that. My grandfather started with the label, actually. That was where he began and what it, he wanted to get it out to people. And he had this message, but he knew how to make soap. And so he put his message on the label and that's, that's where we started. And that's what, you know, was a great intersection for him of his, ability, which was soap making, his opportunity of distributing it and his passion, which was uniting Spaceship Earth and moral, the moral ABC and all of these bigger topics. So sometimes it sounds, you know, wherever you find that intersection might sound a little bit strange, but, uh, but it works. You know, I've talked to uh, a friend of mine who's a plumber and yet he's super passionate about helping people. And he says, 
what he loves about plumbing is that he gets to meet people in their homes hmm. and then he gets to talk to them and help them, you know, take the next step forward. It sounds like he should have been a, a psychologist or something, but he's a plumber um, and that works there. So finding that that intersection between opportunity and passion and ability, it takes creativity, but it's there. Just don't give up on finding it. Hmm. Yeah, well said. I like this a lot. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for making the time for being on Green Planet, Blue Planet today, you know, for writing your blog, Going Green, since, since uh, quite, quite a while, actually, to, to, you know, have the courage, step forward and not just write your book, but also read it out loud so people can get it either in paperback or, you know, Kindle or Audible or all of these things that, you know, we read books in nowadays. And, you know, what I've taken from, from, from looking at, at your book and getting like a little copy myself by a PDF there is it's just there's much more than recipes in there. There's also some great recipes in there, but there's like really a, a, a way to understand yourself in, in kind of the, the daily habits that we have, you know, because how we do one thing is how we do everything. You and I actually said this right before we started recording here. Is there any closing remarks, any call outs, anything you want to mention, any, anything you want to uh, make sure our listeners um, get to hear from you? With what we talked about already, um, I just encourage people to reach out if they are stuck. Don't stay stuck. Reach out to people, um, mm -hmm. somebody you know or somebody, you know, if, you, if any of this is something you have a question about, you can reach me through through Going Green uh, or, or any of my channels. Um, but don't stay stuck. Take the next step forward, um, whatever that may be, and you'll find that that there is progress and there is um, a path forward and you'll, you'll end up somewhere new and that's always fun. Perfect. Thank you so much, Lisa, for being on Green Planet, Blue Planet. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a pleasure to be here. <laughs>